Okay, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Um, my name is Johanny Grossman. I'm the team leader uh, at the Basel Institute on Governance's program on green corruption. And I'm the co-convener of this series of events that we call uh, Corrupting, the Envir uh, Corrupting the Environment, um, which we are co-hosting with the uh, OECD. Uh, we're very pleased to see such uh, active participation and high number of uh, um, uh, engagement from, from all of you and look forward to a very uh, fascinating discussion. Uh, as a reminder, this is the, the third event uh, on the interconnection between environmental degradation, uh, illicit trade and corruption. Uh, we had an event in January uh, that focused on uh, the illicit trade angle uh, of the triangle. In February, we had one that looked at the corruption risks in mineral supply chains. Of course, uh, today we have the event on tracing the funds from environmental crimes. And in April, we have an event focused on behavioral drivers. Um, a little bit of householding before I hand over to our moderators. Um, we have uh, already uh, about 150 people on the, the webinar. I see more, more of us are joining. We're very keen for your active, active participation uh, and for your inputs. There is a Q&A function that we encourage you to use. Um, and, uh, and we have time set aside at the end uh, of the event to address your question. Um, and with that, uh, I hand over to Greta Fenner, the Managing Director at the Basel Institute on Governance. Greta, can you hear us? So it looks like we may have um, we may have lost Greta. Greta is actually joining us from from Dar in uh, in Tanzania and is 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 on the phone. So uh, hopefully she'll rejoin us. Um, but um, we can get started uh, in in the meantime. We have a a great set of uh, uh, panelists here today to talk to you about um, the link and tra tracing the dots um, behind uh, the, the financing of environmental crime. Um, I'm David Lewis. I'm the Executive Secretary of the Financial Action Task Force. And this is a, an issue that's become high on our agenda um, in the last couple of years. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that in a minute. But um, firstly, I'd like to introduce uh, our panel. So we have um, Olivier de Perigo. Olivier is an economist uh, by training. Uh, and since this year is also the CEO of LGT Private Bank. Um, he has taken this position on the merits of a distinguished career in the, in the consulting world, uh, including with McKinsey, uh, followed by senior positions in the insurance and banking world, and a particularly long and distinguished stint as the uh, CFO at LGT Bank uh, prior to taking up uh, this position in the private banking arm. Um, so welcome to you, Olivier. Thanks for joining us today. We also have uh, Werner uh, Venter. Werner is a senior manager in the uh, uh, Financial Intelligence Unit of ABSA Group. He has been working in the field of identifying and mitigating financial crime risks for over 10 years. And uh, he has led at ABSA very successful programs um, enhancing the bank's capacity to detect environmental crime. Uh, and then to a uh, a good friend of mine and to the FATF, um, Daniel Telescuff. Uh, Daniel is globally renowned expert in this area on anti-money laundering, on anti-corruption. He was actually Switzerland's first head of their financial intelligence unit in, in 1998. Um, and um, he then went on to be the head of the FIU for Liechtenstein before returning to, um, uh, to Switzerland. Uh, as the head of the FIU there. He's now uh, working uh, as the Chargé de Mission at the FIU in Monaco, um, but he's served in prestigious roles in the Egmont group of FIUs, uh, leading work there, and also as the co-chair of the Risk, Trends and Method Working Group in, in the FATF. Uh, so I'm chuffed to bits that Daniel can be with us today. Welcome, Daniel. And then uh, Atawimi. Um, Atawimi is an AML CFT advisor at UNODC in, in uh, uh, Southern Africa, uh, a former Director General 
of Malawi's Financial Intelligence Authority, uh, where she helped um, where she helped establish and build it in the first place. She's internationally recognised uh, in this area, uh, bolstering Malawi's capacity to investigate financial crime and her contribution to international cooperation. Um, she was among the first to propel the use of financial investigations in cases of the illegal wildlife trade and is a prominent advocate uh, for following the money um, in, in this field. Um, so uh, we're, we're lucky to have this great panel here with us today. Um, and I hope Greta will be able to, to come back and join us. Um, before I open the panel and ask some questions to, uh, to the panel, I'd just like to say a little bit about the uh, interest of the Financial Action Task Force in this area and why this is of interest to us. Um, many of you uh, may or may not know, but the FATF was created by the G7 30 years ago to tackle the proceeds of drugs trafficking. Um, now, 30 years later, that's still a major problem, um, but it actually pales in significance compared to the proceeds of um, environmental crime. You know, recent estimates have drugs trafficking that's around 90 billion annually. Uh, whereas if you look at environmental crime, it can be up to $280 billion a year. Um, and so uh, even at a conservative estimate, the, the financial cost of environmental crime is, is at least twice that of, um, of drugs trafficking. Um, and so it's all about the money at the end of the day. Uh, and the FATF um, is about following the money. So this is why we're interested in it, it's why we're engaged now. Obviously, it, it has um, serious consequences for the health of people and the planet today as well. Um, we've seen um, that the pandemic potentially flows from the trade in illegal wildlife. Um, we've seen that the planet itself is being destroyed by illegal logging, um, and that that's also leading to climate change. Um, and that the vast proceeds of environmental crime are fueling other serious crimes such as drugs trafficking, people trafficking, um, and arms trafficking. It's actually often the same organized crime groups and networks that are involved in all these uh, crimes. So by going after environmental crime, we're not just hitting environmental crime, we're hitting these, these groups involved in, this, in these other serious crimes as well. And it was two years ago now that the FATF engaged in, in this effort. Uh, and it was the advent of the Chinese presidency of the FATF. And, and I sat down with the Chinese presidency um, and discussed their potential priorities. And I said, look, there's a lot of great work going on in environmental crime at the moment. There's the work of the Royal Foundation of the Duke and Duchess of, of Cambridge and the United for Wildlife initiative that's brought together um, the transport sector and the finance sector. And, and so it's time that the FATF really stepped up and it's an opportunity also for China to get involved and not just involved, but to show some, some leadership. Um, and it was, it was great that they did, you know, all kudos to China, they stepped up and they made this a priority for their presidency of the FATF. We're now into a German presidency of the FATF and we broadened our focus from the illegal trade in wildlife to environmental crime more broadly. Uh, focusing on areas like uh, um, the uh, illegal logging, uh, land clearance and, and waste management. Um, we did a report last year on illegal wildlife trade um, that set out um, some of the challenges that countries face and what needs to be done. It's guidance for authorities to help, follow, to help them follow the money uh, behind the illegal wildlife trade. We're going to follow that up this year. We'll be asking 205 countries in June this year what action they've taken on the back of this report. Um, and we'll be looking at uh, building on the current work we're doing around the, the risks of environmental crime to see if there's a policy response that is required here. So can we go beyond looking at the risks, the trends that we're seeing uh, to try and develop the policy in this area? And so this is gonna be an ongoing focus uh, for the FATF. Um, it's not just, not just a one-off. Um, so also, um, and finally, before I move on to uh, the panel, um, I'm really pleased to say this is again a priority for the G20. Uh, under the Italian presidency of the G20 this year, 
people, planet, prosperity are their key themes. Climate change is back on the agenda. Climate crime, environmental crime is, is of interest to them. Also to the G7 this year under, under the UK presidency. So it's never really had as much attention uh, as I think uh, we're seeing today. Um, and this, uh, th this event today is timely, timely because of that. So with that, um, I will now turn to the panel and I'd like to start with um, Olivier. Uh, now, Olivier, a recent ACAM survey acknowledged that IWT uh, is one of the most prominent money laundering risks. Uh, the same survey, however, showed that it's the kind of risk that compliance pre professionals feel least prepared to tackle. Uh, apparently only 27% of the survey participants said their institutions were, were ready to flag transactions potentially linked to uh, wildlife trafficking and environmental crime. And it was only, um, uh, uh, it was the uh, only uh, of six compliance topics uh, where participants said that they were more, uh, where they were unprepared, uh, more unprepared than prepared. So in light of this, um, what do you think is the problem? Are we asking too much, particularly the financial sector? Is it realistic that banks can fine tune their transaction monitoring and customer due diligence systems even more? Um, so Olivier, over to you. Olivier, I think you may still be on mute. Oh, I'm sorry I had to repeat those immortal words now. Go for it. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go for it. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for, 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 for the introduction and uh, your, your, your nice words. Um, at the beginning, it's a real pleasure and an honor to, to be present here and to have the opportunity to um, bring so, some ideas and also to present a little bit what we've done on the, the FAST initiative side and perhaps to try to draw some, some parallels. Perhaps to answer your question up front, can, is it, are we asking too much or not? I definitely think we are not asking too much and there is a lot that can, can be done, but um, we will go to it perhaps in more detail. Perhaps as an introduction, very briefly, who or what is this uh, FAST initiative? FAST stands as an abbreviation for finance against slavery and trafficking. Um, it was launched um, as a private-public partnership um, under a uh, little bit the initiative of the Principality of Liechtenstein together with the authorities, the government of um, the Netherlands and uh, Australia. Um, we were also supported and backed by the United Nations and um, there was a working group, we called it a commission, that uh, worked quite intensely um, during one year, so it started in September 2018 and presented its result at its results at the United Nations um, in September 2019, um, and it continues to to work. We are, if you want, on one side, really trying to lobby in the positive sense with regulators, authorities, financial institutions, obviously, and companies, and also. Um, we provide some training modules, um, uh, perhaps four or five months ago. Um, I believe there were more than 5,000 banking professionals that have uh, followed some training programs via the ACAMS on the modern slavery human trafficking topic out of the, the FAST initiative. And I'm sure this uh, number has also increased. So I must also say for me personally, a, a, a great and new experience because obviously it's an area you're not really familiar with, but certainly something that personally also opened for me the, my, my eyes. Perhaps one important thing, the initiative comprised experts from government, from law enforcement, from authorities, from banks, but there were also two and we call them survivors. So people who used to be victims of slavery, of trafficking, and who could um, deliver themselves or free themselves from, from these very bad conditions. And that was also on a human note, always very impressive and reminding us that we are not just talking 
about frameworks and 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 concepts, but it's it's unfortunately a, a really a real sad reality. Now to the topic itself, I, I think there are many parallels between um, what is going on or, or the and the challenges in respect with the, the trafficking slavery dimension and the environmental crime. What are those those parallels? Um, first of all, there is, in my view, a significant, yet perhaps not sufficiently known role and perhaps even responsibility of the financial industry. The second parallel is, and um, I, I looked a little bit deeper into it, uh, I really think also when it comes to frameworks, technical tools, um, and so on, there are um, some, some parallels. I will perhaps address that a, a little bit later on. And thirdly, um, what really struck me during the entire project was that although everyone, every single person you would talk to about slavery or human trafficking would say this is totally unacceptable, it's a core pillar of human rights and so on. But on the other side, um, it is not sufficiently addressed. Why that? And I think there are many parallels. Um, one is, first of all, it is in a way a complex topic. There is um, always the challenge of multi-layered supply and value chains. This dilutes the causality, this dilutes the responsibility. But on the other side, it's sometimes easy to hide behind this complexity. But to me, this is not an excuse. If we think of other topics we address very frontally in terms of money laundering, there is no money launderer in the world who will raise his hand and say, look at me, I'm a money launderer. So it's exactly the same. Um, what is perhaps also a challenge is that there is a perception gap. It's a very fluid topic. It's a fully integrated a part of our life, of our economy, where does it start, where does it end? And that is also, in my view, a, a, big, a big challenge. Um, I mentioned the tools and the frameworks. Um, one very clear goal of the FAST initiative was not to publish one more report, um, which is very interesting, but perhaps doesn't get enough traction and impact. So we really, from the beginning, wanted to be action and implementation oriented. Um, so there is a very concrete blueprint and a kind of toolbox. And um, if you are interested, you can also find it on, on the internet under fastinitiative.org. And um, there is, uh, I believe, three different levels of aggregation of the report to make the, the reading and the, the use easy. And um, if you are interested, um, I think it's really interesting and, and, and useful. And you will see there are many parallels that can be used also for, for environmental crimes. I don't want to go too much into detail, just highlighting in terms of the toolbox and of the the framework, what, what are perhaps areas? I, I think um, one very clear area is that in uh, when it comes to financial crime compliance, the corroboration of the source of wealth, where does the money come from, um, is a very important. And you should and can include also aspects like human trafficking, modern slavery, but also environmental crime. Um, of course, you need data, you need information, but this information is uh, to a certain extent available, um, perhaps not yet sufficiently organized and structured, but um, I'm sure that will develop also if I look at the general trends in ESG sustainability and so on. What I also think is while we can always and have to rely on the uh, private effort and the private responsibility of the financial industry. This is a very complex and global topic where a, a little bit of regulation, a little bit of regulatory control and push 
is necessary. Without this, um, I, I don't think we, we will be sufficiently um, strong. And um, my sense is that also from, from this side, um, additional frameworks, taxonomies, etc., could would be more than welcome. Um, one interesting aspect that was also discussed was that um, an increased collaboration between the different authorities, FIUs, uh, law enforcement authorities, etc., and possible ways to include the financial industry in a kind of safe harbor was was also uh, a mention a, a dimension that was discussed and obviously um, there is a second level which is that as the fi as finance industry you sit on 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 money where is the money invested where is capital allocated to be it via lending be it by via um, uh, investing exercising your voting rights and this is definitely also something where the finance industry can play a role, be it in terms of supply chain finance, be it as asset managers, as private banks, and so on. So this would be, in a nutshell, um, my summary. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, obviously, the work you're doing uh, on human trafficking is, is tremendously important. And um, uh, there are lessons to be learned, as you shared with, with us just then, for the work on environmental crime. And I know that Daniel is also involved in this as an ambassador uh, doing a lot of outreach for that effort. So uh, very commendable and thank you for sharing um, your initial thoughts on, on how we can uh, how we can learn from that. And I, I, I would encourage everyone to have a look at the, uh, the fastinitiative.org website for the, the blueprint and the toolkit you, you talked about. Um, I'm delighted to say I can now see Greta, who's uh, joined us, I think, uh, from, from DAR. Greta, can you hear us now? I can hear you, and I'm sincerely sorry for the for the technical problems. But a alert, in addition to bad internet. So, David, uh, thank you for taking. I just wanted to everyone and apologies for being an, an, a non-present co-moderator. I can see the discussions already in the middle of uh, you know of the hot of the topic. So why don't we continue? I think we were also going to bring Werner in, so maybe we can continue with Werner next, David, and then I'll. I'll right. join as per uh, script, but welcome everyone. Thank you. All right, thanks, Greta. So um, yes, Werner, um, could you share your experience of um, uh, of tackling uh, uh, financial crime and this issue, and um, you know, building on uh, what, uh, what what we just heard from Olivier? What has what has been your experience, particularly in adapting uh, client risk profiles to environmental crime uh, to to better detect? suspicious transactions and suspicious behavior. Yeah, so th thank you, David. Thank you for that question. And, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this panel. So from an, from an APSA Group Limited perspective, um, we've adapted our client risk profiles to focus primarily on key three customer behavioral aspects. So one, we looked at cross-border related activity. Two, we looked at general income activity. And three, we focused on cash-based activity. Now, before I go into details regarding those three key aspects, I think it's important to understand that from an APSA Group Limited perspective, being a bank headquartered in South Africa with majority of our operations in Africa, we are inherently exposed to quite a high level of environmental crime risk. Now, that in itself presents some data analysis issues particularly if we start to look at things like customer types or industry types. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that further, but to take you back to the, to the first three points or the points I've mentioned, when we looked at cross-border activity, we made a decision to look at inbound activity from high-risk environmental crime areas. Now, we took the notion to focus specifically on inbound activity, um, with South Africa being a primary supplier country, um, thus supplying goods and then being paid for, for the goods, so funds coming in and product moving out. Um, but that initial data set gave us quite a large volume of transactions, as one can imagine. Uh, so we had to apply further data limitations, and we basically did this just by asking the question, who is receiving these funds? You know, what industries do the customers relate to that receive these funds? 
uh, that assisted us to, to narrow down and segment customer types and focus on high-risk industries. Um, but now to my point earlier, being based in Africa, yes, it, it, it narrowed down the data set, but unfortunately we still had a lot of results. And that by virtue is just where we headquartered and, and with regards to the markets we operate in. So we went further to narrow down the data set and we basically, this is where local intelligence and you know, local knowledge comes into play. So we started to look at specific areas in South Africa that is more vulnerable to wildlife trafficking. Um, and also certain areas in South Africa that might see the certain syndicate related activity. Um, we then applied that data filter across and that gave us a data set we, we could work with and that ultimately gave us some good leads for investigation. Um, the second portion, looking at general income related activity, it was very much targeted towards green corruption. So we looked at certain customers employed in certain employment sectors that we've now come to know through past investigations and local intelligence to be more vulnerable to corruption within that environmental crime value chain. So we looked at custom, customers employed in those sectors, and then we started to target down towards certain areas in South Africa, as mentioned previously, because some of those um, industry types or those employment sectors were unfortunately quite broad. Um, then again, that also gave us some really good leads to, to start investigations from. Then looking at the last aspect, um, cash-based activity, and I think a number of participants has heard this before, is cash is still considered king in, in the environmental crime value chain, especially when we look at lower to mid-level actors. And we try to target this towards detecting potential front company, companies utilizing large cash or displaying large cash behavior, and then similarly trying to potentially detect commingling of funds. So we looked at a lot of companies that are based surrounding the large national parks in South Africa, for example, but we also further applied data limitations to focus on certain industry types, so high-risk industry types. So that one way is, is how we as APSA have, have utilized intelligence and information shared, particularly through the United for Wildlife um, to adapt our client risk profiles to address some of the risks associated with environmental crimes. Thank you, Verna. I was, um, yes, I should have mentioned that you are very active, uh, Absa, in, in the United for Wildlife initiative. And I think that initiative is, is five years old uh, this month, if I'm not wrong, um, when the agreement was signed at Buckingham, Buckingham Palace, I think. So, uh, fantastic effort on your part. And it's great that your firm's engaged and some really great insights there on, on how you are, have been able to adapt and, uh, and follow the money behind environmental crime. So thank you. Um, Greta, um, over to you. Or not. Greta seems to have frozen on my screen. Uh, yes. <laughs> Hello. You're back again. No, I, I am here. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, and sorry uh, again for this. Uh, I think we've spoken very interestingly now about two banks who operate in very different geographical spheres. And, and I think that's been really showcasing the different approaches that also need to be taken. And, and likewise, we, we now got the two panelists who have an FIU background, who also in a way have been operating in the FIU space in, in similarly different um, geographical areas whereby you know the, the risk exposure is quite different so Danny um, I think you know we have found that FIUs and, and we've had this discussion have have not so far been uh, focused really on IWT and another form of environmental crime uh, do you, with your experience in, in in different FIUs what do you think are the challenges why is that so uh, what are the barriers? And, and in a perfect world, what should be uh, the role of FIUs? What could they do and could they do more realistically? Uh, thanks a lot, Greta, uh, and thanks for having me in that conversation. Thanks also, David, for your kind introductory words. You, you've always been a visionary to me, and the fact that you don't have a beard anymore, you had one when Corona started, makes me makes me feel very optimistic that this may be the end of the pandemic. So sorry, back to back to business on, on your 
on your question. I think I'm increasingly concerned that we may not get the risk-based approach right. Because if we got it right, a, a form of crime with that magnitude would be more center stage. I'm, I can't speak of, of all countries individually, and there may be exceptions, but I think we have a serious problem in the way we assess the threat. Um, this, of course, then impacts on our anti-money laundering or anti-financial crime regime too. Because um, FIUs, like any other stakeholder in the ML chain, will, will you know, prioritize their work along the conclusions of the national risk assessments. But if environmental crime doesn't appear as a major threat in the assessments, then very little will happen. There are, I think, a number of, I'm a little bit more positive about, about the future to come. First of all, as David mentioned, the engagement of the FATF in that regard, the continued engagement. This was not a one-off report on IWT. The work is continuing. And this will have an impact on domestic strategies and, and priorities. Also, the work of individual FIUs who are leading the path. Most of them, I must say, from non-OECD countries. And we have Atuveni here from Malawi, who did phenomenal work on, on this topic in, in her own country. I know South Africa is an important player here. So there's a lot of drive here. and We can learn a lot from, from these FIUs. And I do hope that others will, will join them, even if they are maybe not in a country where they would see the cash transactions related to these forms of crimes, but be further down the, the value chain or, or by downstream. Um, I'm also optimistic and very grateful that the Egmont Group has engaged on that work, especially the, the Egmont Center of um, Excellence and Leadership, ECOFEL, has done great work in, on um, IWT, um, provided training, outreach to FIUs. So these are some factors that make me more optimistic, but I continue to be concerned that we don't very often don't get it right at the outset. Now, what role can FIUs have on your second part of the question? Um, I don't think the role is that different from other priority areas like modern slavery and human trafficking that Olivier mentioned already, or corruption or tax or whatever, you know, terrorist financing, whatever uh, your domestic frameworks uh, uh, has as major issues. I don't think it's so different. Um, FIUs have huge analytical capacities. They have access to data, which is phenomenal very often underutilized, I must say. They have unique ways to collaborate and exchange information internationally. Again, underutilized, if, we, if you ask me, that's, that's far more would be possible to be done. And in a, in a crime that has so predominantly a cross-border nature like environmental crimes, this, this could be a major factor. Um, also the powers of FAU to obtain additional information in many countries go well beyond what law enforcement or regulators can do. So all these together gives, gives a great potential. Um, but I think essentially that all these factors will only play out in favor of the victims of these crimes if we do what Olivier already said is a far better collaboration with the private sector. Um, and I welcome, congratulate the, the task force, the, Werner and, and, and David have, have mentioned that uh, you're leading by example here. Um, but the FIUs have to be on board. And we do have a number of countries, including FATF members. And my home country, unfortunately, belongs to them. We allow me that comment that still haven't set up private public partnerships. And I think we, we should also talk about responsibility of countries. That's not a recommendation. I think for me, that's a must to engage in better private pu public partnership to help reporting entities to detect crime. We depend on the work of financial institutions and non-financial institutions to some regard. And if we don't help them to get, to identify suspicious transactions, then all the rest will be less, definitely less effective. And I think there's a responsibility more than a recommendation to do so. And we probably should come to the point where we sooner or later address those that don't do it, you know, and that we that we also make people um, responsible and uh, and accountable for for neglect. So with that, I'm I'm optimistic. I'm always optimistic when you work in this business. You have to be an optimist. Um, but I do see significant challenges in FIUs, but also beyond FIUs in the whole AML chain. Thank, thank you, Daniel. Um, and um, I think we may have lost pressure again. So I will. 
carry on and see if she rejoins us um, uh, before the end. Um, you, you picked on two really important topics here that the FHFs identified a real need for. Uh, and the first is around risk and understanding of risk. And as I was talking to Ashawemi before the uh, before the call started, um, you know, FIUs have so many priorities. Um, this is never going to work if if the risk hasn't been properly identified in the first place. Um, and as the work of Egmont shows that you're more than aware of, um, uh, environmental crime just doesn't feature in in most national risk assessments yet, um, and everything flows from that. So we need to do a better job to to make sure the risk is understood and identified, and then collaboration, as both you and, and Werner have said, collaboration with the private sector is, is, is critical here, as in with, with other crime types. Um, with that, uh, Atawemi, you, you've um, recently spoken in a podcast about uh, the work, your work in Malawi to enhance uh, the capacity to detect and investigate illegal wildlife trafficking. Um, what are some of the measures that have been put in place in Malawi uh, that are key in enabling the FIU to play a role in detecting IWT and environmental crime? And, and what is still missing, apart from sort of the general issue of resources and capacity, which is, which is always an issue, um, what, 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 are the, some, what are the other constraints um, that you, you see there? And how does the work of an FIU in detecting environmental crime differ from its general work in detecting other types of crime, if indeed there are any differences? Um, thank you very much, David. I think uh, to ride on to or ride on on what Daniel has talked about about the risk assessment for Malawi, the starting point was the risk assessment. So in 2015, Malawi did its first national risk assessment, and in that national risk assessment, there was no wildlife mentioned anywhere. And yet, even as going back as far back as 2016, um, there were IWT offenses happening. And in fact, Malawi was, this was a big issue, even in Malawi. Uh, but what changed everything was that in 2018, in revising the first national risk assessment, uh, we decided to say, let's put IWT as an area that we can assess. And one of the things that led to that was because uh, there was a discussion to revise the IWT law in the country. And so the National Risk Assessment touched on IWT, and it came out that IWT offenses were amongst the most uh, proceeds generating crimes in the country. So because of that, it put that on our radar as an FIU. And so we began to see how do we uh, help law enf enforcement in investigating and prosecuting these crimes. And obviously the first step was to build partnerships. So we built partnerships with the Department of National Parks and Wildlife and others around who were helping the Department of National Parks and Wildlife. And with that, we also went and gave them training on what money laundering is, how it's connected to IWT, uh, uh, talk to them about how they can inform us if there are things that they would like us to, any information they would want from us, how the FIU works, how we can be beneficial to them. And that helped really cement the relationship and then forming uh, investigative task forces together with the investigators in the Department of National Parks and Wildlife, the police investigators. And our role simply was to look at the issue of following the money. Where did the money go? And what happened with that money? Uh, it was not an easy process because Malawi generally is a cash economy. And I'm sure there are so many that are that way. So most of the people that actually do commit the offenses of poaching uh, receive money in cash and it's very minimal amounts. They, they have no reason to take it to the bank. So that makes it very hard for the FIU to trace those people and to link them to the people who are the kingpins. Um, and so I believe that for FIUs, it's about making sure that as an FIU, you are in the forefront pushing for a risk assessment that looks at IWT so that as a country, you understand what your risks are and you respond accordingly. Without that, it's not going to be possible. Uh, other things were also that apart from uh, the risk assessment as an FIU, we were given some investigative powers to, to now do financial investigations. And that meant there was some acceptance with law enforcement. Now I know generally FIUs are not required to have investigative powers, 
but regardless, there could be a way of building relationships with law enf enforcement in a way that encourages closer collaboration where IWT is concerned. Um, the truth is, this is a new area. And if there is no proper coordination and the FIU is not brought into the fold quick enough, uh, so many things can fall on the wayside. Um, in terms of what is remaining, I think the biggest problem that's remaining is in financial institutions, the sort of training compliance officers are given needs to improve. We know that some of the indicators that have been identified are similar across the board. Now there has to be a recognition that the indicators in supply countries are going to be very different from those in the receiving countries. So we have to look, I mean, think about it in Malawi, a compliance officer in Malawi is going to tell you people who actually go and poach do not, do, don't have bank accounts. So how do you expect me to even look for any indicators? There are going to be no indicators at all. So those are some of the considerations we need to uh, take into account. What sort of things should they be looking at? And I think somewhere, somehow there is a gap in that regard. Um, the only difference with IWT, I guess, for the FIU, at least in my experience, was that the risks were higher in terms of doing this work because you have, uh, you're have you dealing with people uh, who want to take a high value product out of the country and they're going to do anything to try and prevent that, including corrupting law enforcement officers. So you'd go to ask for inf uh, information in, 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 in a law enforcement office in a police station, for instance, you'd have zero cooperation because you know, and you'd immediately know that possibly there's some corruption that has come in. So it becomes a little more complex in that regard because you're not just dealing with one offense. It, you end up, uh, the issues of cor corruption come in and there are turf wars as well. So that kind of complicates things. And like other ordinary financial crimes, everyone believes it's the business of the FIU. So no one is going to mess around with you. But with IWT, they'll be like, what's your interest in this? It has nothing to do with finances. Why are you involved? So that, those are some of the challenges that um, I, I can immediately think about. Thank you. Well, thank you, Atawemi, and um, uh, thank you so much for sharing that experience. And actually, it's a reason to be positive, I think, because it shows that um, when a country does take action, when it includes this in its study of its risks at a national level, then everything else flows from that. And, and the work that you've led in Malawi um, and, the, and, and the success you're starting to have and the understanding that you have around what's necessary to do, I think, is, is a um, shows shows a way to many other countries, shows a way forward for many other countries. So um, yes, another reason to be optimistic uh, and it shows that the risk-based approach, although difficult, is possible. Um, so, so thank you and, and, and well done for your contribution on, on that. Um, so we've now been through everyone on the panel and we have an opportunity to, to take some questions um, from, from the audience. Um, I'm going to look at the the chat box we have here and uh, just take a, a couple at random. Uh, so we have a question from, from Paul Ford, um, who says, in attempting to secure closer relationships with the private sector, uh, as recommended by the FATF, how are hurdles like client confidentiality and GDPR, you know, data protection in Europe, uh, and tipping off uh, uh, restrictions, how are they overcome in, in practice. Um, so I guess anyone um, uh, on the panel could, could have a go at that. Um, so I will throw it out there. Um, does anyone want to have a first shot at the, how, how we overcome those issues around client confidentiality and data protection? So Dave, um, I can comment on, on that question, perhaps from a South African perspective. Um, so, so in South Africa, we've, we've been able to establish the South African Anti-Money Laundering Integrated Task Force. Now, it's uh, basically based, it, it's a public-private partnership between the banks and the FIU and law enforcement, and that provides the legal platform for banks to share information amongst each other. Um, so that's, that's how we've we've encountered or tackled that problem from a South African perspective. Um, and just maybe worth to note as well is, you know, the United for Wildlife, there's different 
task forces that, that split out of SAMLET, um, which is the acronym for South African Money Laundering Integrated Task Force. And one of those is specifically focused on wildlife trafficking. And the United for Wildlife is one of the partners on the expert working group looking at wildlife trafficking. Um, so that's how we've, we've encountered that from a South African perspective. Thank you, Verna. Um, and actually, one of the other questions uh, from the audience was about, um, uh, well, asking for examples of successful public-private partnerships. And it sounds like the one in South Africa, uh, one that I wasn't aware of, is, is certainly providing you with the ability to, to have those important information and intelligence sharing relationships that are so, are so necessary. Um, would other, other members of the panel like to, to comment on, on how you overcome uh, the sort of client confidentiality and data protection rules, perhaps drawing from lessons on, on the uh, human trafficking side? I don't know if Olivier or, or Daniel, you, you, can, you can talk to the, that, that issue. Uh, look, this was, this was an important part of our work too. Of course, if you talk about private public partnership, you talk about sharing of information and then you talk about privacy as well. But first of all, I think what Werner is doing with his colleagues in South Africa is evidence where there is a will, there's a way. Uh, I think it is a consideration. You have to be clear about that. You have to build it into the concept. But, uh, you know, data protection is never, can never be a detriment to, to fighting crime. I mean, this was never the meaning of data protection, even the staunchest defenders of privacy wouldn't would, would have to agree to that. So I think you have to give early consideration to that topic because it is it is not the easiest one depending on a national framework, but we have seen so many examples where it worked as it can't be an excuse not to do it. I think that's that's uh, the starting point we're having. Also, I believe where there are at the end, if you if you face a situation where in a partnership you you run into legal problems relating to privacy it, it may then limit a bit what you can do now but it should never limit you to go the extra mile and propose legislation to address this and if and that's a lesson learned from olivia i don't know if you agree from what we did if the financial industry and the regulators that for using law enforcement jointly come up with a proposal politically this is probably relatively easy to, to convince governments and, and, and parliaments to, to do the right thing but it has to come from us we can't wait for uh, legislation to change automatically and then start. And thanks, David, for your clear words on that subject matter at, uh, at your speech at the Chatham House uh, recently. You were very clear, and I think that's an important message that, that must come and should come from the FATF too. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, and it's, it's um, uh, indeed a topic of focus for the FATF right now. And, and just last week, we brought together FATF members with data protection authorities to look again at this issue, uh, because although most data protection laws have exemptions, um, and when you get the authorities in the room, they say it is possible. In practice, we know that uh, when banks get legal advice, it's more complicated than that. So it's an area we need to remain focused on, I think, and, and see if we can continue to overcome some of the challenges uh, that they present. You're absolutely right. Data protection and tackling um, tackling money laundering, whether it's for environmental or other crimes, uh, are not in competition. They do not need to be in competition, um, but we need to get it better understood. And D David, if, if, sorry, if I may jump in um, on, on that front, perhaps another example at the other extreme, I, I think we, we, we learned in the FAST initiative is in Brazil, where there is like a public registry of companies that have been caught uh, for human trafficking and modern slavery. So there is like a, a public blacklist of companies that have offended against, uh, against this type of, uh, of uh, human trafficking and, and slavery issues. So that's, that's on the other side. So I think uh, coming back to what Daniel said, where there is a will, there is a way. Uh, Brazil clearly showed it. That's really, really interesting. I didn't, I didn't know about that. It, it raises an interesting question for environmental crime. Um, and um, uh, even in, in, in Brazil, uh, perhaps. Um, uh, and uh, clearly registries providing this information is, is, um, is, 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 is a much, you know, is information that everyone can make use of. Um, so that's an interesting uh, parallel. So um, 
I'm just looking back now at um, the questions we received. We've got one um, from an attendee who asks um, about mobile money. Uh, and, and Werner, this is um, directed at you, and I imagine because you know, the prevalence of mobile money in, in your region. Um, uh, how are, um, uh, how, how is that, how are you dealing with the challenge of, of mobile, mobile money and, and the fact that this is overtaking cash in, in some of, some of the economies around the world? Yeah, so I think from a, from especially a wildlife trafficking perspective, um, you know, things like mobile money has been noted as, as an area of concern. Um, I think to some extent, it's still very prevalent in the lower levels of the value chain, um, where, it's, where it's, you know, smaller type of payments being utilized to, to, to pay actors in that value chain. Um, so when, when we would target that, um, you know, we would look at it very similar. It is difficult to trace, um, but it's definitely something that is on our radar, given our, our presence and the risks we've identified associated with that. Um, but it's something that, you know, when you look at it from a transactional perspective, it's important to be able to, to segregate that from the other customer related activity to try and pick up on, on where that is going and where it's coming from. Um, it is prevalent and we've been noted through, through some of our, our engagement locally that some, something like a mobile number, for example, is increasingly important um, in terms of law enforcement efforts because it provides them the opportunity to, to geolocate certain customers. Um, so that has been something that, that's come through from our local engagements as well. Thank you, Verna. I, I think that's an important point that's often forgotten when we talk about the intelligence that's available uh, within the information that's gathered on a day-to-day -day basis by banks. It's not just the, the information that you know, the FATF may require around identity. Um, you know, you have uh, mobile numbers stored from you know every conversation you have with with customers and um, and that information um, is increasingly valuable um, for the whole host of crimes from environmental crime to terrorist financing. Um, so um, it's it's encouraging to hear that you're dealing with that and also um, mobile money. I think it's probably safe to say there is a good level of awareness in or a greater level of awareness in in national risk assessments. Uh, of that, and it's easier to follow mobile money than it is cash, um, which has to be a, another another good thing. Um, Perhaps I, I could yeah, add a bit on the question of the mobile money to say that, um, like in in our in in Malawi, what happens is that the mobile money companies are also regulated as a payment system, and because of that, uh, for AML purposes, they are given limits. So if you're if you are if you are operating within a certain limit, you you can only transact so much per day and so much per week. Your account can only hold so much money. And if you are moving to a, a graduated step of transactions, you have to go and show proof of a source of income. You have to go and show um, what has changed in your circumstances for the mobile money company to change your circumstances. And then for the FIA they receive uh, transactions, not just suspicious transactions from the mobile money companies, but they also receive um, large value transactions. So basically the mobile money company is required to look at the transactions of their customers and say, is this normal for this, for this customer? If it isn't, then it is reported. So in that way, and then again, we look at the regions within the country to say which region, regions have wildlife. Uh, what are the sort of transactions that are coming from that area, where the numbers were either registered or where they ping from in terms of the cell, to, uh, cell phone tower. So all those things um, help, but it is taxing. It's a lot of work to actually do that. So that is where the problem lies with mobile money. It takes a lot more out of the analysts in the FIU. Yeah. Thank you, Atawemi. Um, going back to the, the questions in, in the chat, we have um one uh one for olivier on on the role of banks in in switzerland and uh the need for greater transparency um uh and are banks really on board to take on on those changes um uh for example um where we've seen trade financing of oil from the amazon um and i i don't know if there's anything you you can say um 
uh, about that, Olivier? Um, it's, um, it's, I guess it's a big question. It's difficult to, to speak in, 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 in general terms. Uh, I, I, but generally, I would say that there is on one side the dimension, well, what are companies or financial institutions willing or ready to do and where, the, where is their commercial intent or, 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 or policy? And that's my sense, the way the question is towards what this question is geared to. And I think that there are different positions uh, of different institutions as we can read daily in the, in the newspapers, unfortunately. And, and then you have the other dimension, which is if as an institution, you say, we don't want this type of business, you are nevertheless faced with the fact that it is not always easy to recognize and to to identify problematic clients or or problematic transactions etc so i think we one has to to separate the, the the two dimensions that would be perhaps my answer thank you olivier oh, and while i've got you there are there seems to be quite a lot of interest in in getting lists of names for human trafficking and um uh, whether you could share the uh, the list the brazil list you spoke about so so maybe we can find a way to share that with the audience. Um, either yeah, we, we, absolutely, no, we can certainly find a way to, uh, to, to share this, the, this information. I'm sure it's also mentioned in, the, in this FAST report I mentioned. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, there's, then there's a question from uh, Shira uh, about cryptocurrencies. Do we know if cryptocurrencies are being used for transactions in environmental crime? Um, so I wonder if any of our FIU colleagues, or, or indeed at the, uh, the, the banking colleagues, can, can speak to whether they've spotted that at all. I, my, my expectation is that they, it is happening because we're seeing it in other areas. Um, but as Atuemi said, a lot of the transactions uh, in the environmental space, space, at least are starting off in cash. Um, and... Um, uh, maybe the, the cryptocurrencies would come in later on um, when the demand side or the networks involved in the demand side in, in countries in the Far East and so on are, are making payments for, for shipments. Um, I, think, I think there are examples of that. Um, but um, do, do, do panel members have any experience on, on the cryptocurrency side they'd like to share? David, I, I got that. Yes, or no, please. No, okay. Uh, yeah, so David, I know I just concur with your point. I think um, from what we've seen is, yes, we've noted some crypto-related activity to other crimes, maybe as part of the, the suspected laundering process, but specifically associated with environmental crimes or wildlife crimes, we haven't come across any cases where they've utilized cryptocurrency um, as a payment method in the value chain. Thanks, Werner. And Daniel, did you have anything to, you wanted to add to that? No, I, I, I concur what you said. I think there's no reason why criminals shouldn't use cryptocurrencies for one of their businesses. Uh, but it's true, we haven't seen many cases to the best of my knowledge, but that probably says more about our capacities to detect rather than whether or not it's happening. So there the are inherent risks and they do apply to all forms of crime. I think that will be my short answer. Indeed. Um, and. Um, uh, now that uh, we have a global standard uh, requiring the, the regulation of, of cryptocurrencies um, and the technology companies are stepping up to help with the implementation of that standard and identifying the sort of the, the sending and receiving beneficiaries, uh, I think we can, we should be able to look forward to being able to identify these transactions easier in the future and the FIU should be able to play, play a bigger role. Uh, than they've been able to so far. Um, I'd just like to check with you, Hani. How are we doing with time? Um, we're still good. Maybe we have time for one or two more questions. Okay, excellent. Um, so let me let me look down the the list again. Uh, um, one question from Stephen: Are criminal and anti money laundering laws in large financial centres? Um, including Switzerland, sufficient to target predicate environmental crimes committed abroad. 
This is interesting. Uh, I um, I, I um, held a, a workshop on illegal logging with Chatham House some years back, and we had uh, we had some of the Caribbean, the UK overseas territories around the table, and some NGOs from Indonesia. Um, and one of the challenges the overseas territories faced is that um, illegal logging, they said, wasn't a crime in their jurisdiction. Well, they didn't, you know, it wasn't an issue for them. But of course, what the uh, Indonesians saw is all the laundering. Uh, of illegal logging in Indonesia going through these territories. So it clearly is an issue and, and, and the, the adequacy of laws and regulations, I think I would say is an issue. Um, that was some time ago though. So I, I just wonder if the panel has any views on, on that as an issue. Daniel. Yeah, if, if I may, because also the, uh, the question was, was mentioning Switzerland. So indeed, I think this is an issue for all countries that do not have an all crimes approach when it comes to the definition of predicate offenses. So logically, if a crime is not in the list of predicate offenses, then it will not necessarily be captured by the ML framework. I'm not saying totally outside, uh, but, but you will uh, certainly when you when you come to investigation prosecutions, you would face difficulties. And in Switzerland, we detected that major forms of illegal wildlife trafficking were not considered to be a serious crime. So the FIU at my time, we were pushing hard and supporting our colleagues in the uh, environmental department um, to uh, include those. There was a, a proposal in parliament made which found a majority. So I think that gap is going to be closed. But I, I have the impression that some countries are not, some countries may not even be aware that they may have a gap here because it, it's not really center stage yet. And I think the same would also apply to uh, other environmental crimes, which were not traditionally, you know, um, uh, in scope. Uh, yes, the FATF standard requires that they are covered, but it doesn't go into the detail to what degree it has to be covered. So I think that, um, yes, in a number of countries, this is a real issue. It should never be, however, an issue whether you should report a suspicious transaction to the FIU or not. You know, you, that's not the question that you, that's not the point that you should not report because it may not be a crime, but it may become a problem later on in the investigation and prosecution and in international cooperation, unfortunately. Indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, so I'm going to give the last question, um, uh, which I've just lost, um, to um, Alexandra from uh, the Environmental Investigative uh, Forum, EIF. Um, and this is a forum that allows journalists and experts to cooperate on environmental uh, investigations. Um, and he wanted to ask very generally how we see the availability uh, of data and, and uh, to, civ to civil society uh, journalists and, and advocates in this area. Um, and is, is it likely that more, more data is going to be available um, to civil society to help organizations like them? So you know, data on on those involved, or, or I guess the ways in which environmental crime is is happening, um, I, I I I guess I should direct those two questions to the to, to Daniel Natawemi um, uh, because I guess the data would probably come from the public sector primarily. Uh, maybe public private partnerships gives us uh, a way forward there, but they don't yet include civil society as, as far as I'm aware. Do, do you have any views on, on this issue? That's away me. Well, I would say that indeed, as, as you have rightly put it, that this data would come from the public sector, but and, and that maybe the problem would be there is no uniform way of dealing with such data. Again, looking at issues of data protection and privacy. Um, and so it would really depend with the jurisdiction that you're dealing with. It might be easier to have such data and to keep it and to make it public, most likely in receiving countries. I'm not quite certain about the source countries and what would happen. I'm looking at my own setting and looking at the possibility of having such. It's already difficult to do that. Just to have a database on PEPs is, is, is a headache what more on those that have committed the crime? It would be a nightmare. Um, and, and perhaps maybe this is where the private sector could come in and help. Maybe it's something that they can put up, which can be accessed by private citizens as well as the public sector. And that could be of help to both. Um, that, that, that would be, those would be my thoughts. Thank you. 
Um, and um, if I may squeeze in one more question, Yohani. Um, there's one here from Stephen Scott. Thank you for the, for the thumbs up. Um, Stephen says that most law enforcement, tax and intelligence agencies receive FIU disclosure intel packages. Um, and he's wondering if environmental or wildlife departments, you know, rangers, investigators, have the same access to FIU intelligence products. Um, I think that's a, that's, that's a good question and one I wanted to squeeze in there. So I don't know if, if Daniel or Atawemi uh, are able to speak to that. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I would say it depends. I think it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and how, where you place your wildlife so, uh, departments. In our case, they receive the intel from the FIU. And the reason is because they have specific investigators from the police and prosecutors from the director of public prosecutions seconded to the department. So you know that when you're dealing with them, you're dealing with law enforcement. We understand that this is intelligence and this is how it should be looked at. And the MOU with the FIU specifically says that uh, those are the people who receive this intel and they know what to do with it. Thank you. Um, so look, I think I will draw the Q&A to a close there. There were a few questions we, we didn't get to. Uh, there was one about whether there is going to be a recording of, of this panel, and I understand that that is the intention. Um, so if you, if you missed it, um, it should be possible to, uh, to, to, to watch it again um, at, at some point soon. Um, I'd like to thank the panel. Um, it's been a fantastic panel, a great mixture of expertise from the public and private sector. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I won't go through what, what you all said, um, but I'd like to draw together some of the key points um, and also reflect on some of the findings that the, the FATF is, is seeing in, in this area. I, I think going forward, the top priority for both the public and the private sector, for governments and the private sector, is to assess their risk exposure. You know, this is where Daniel starts off. Everything starts with a better understanding of risk um, and their exposure to uh, the laundering uh, of uh, the proceeds from environmental crime. And to ensure that financial intelligence units are included in national initiatives to combat environmental crime. And that comes back to the, the last question we had about to what extent others are involved. And it does happen in some countries, but not in many. Um, and so this is not only limited to FIUs in countries with domestic environmental crime, um, as, as, as the financial flows from this are, are much broader. Um, FIUs need to work much more generally with the private sector. Uh, I think you know, there are some good examples of that, but it's still early days. Um, but not just the financial sector. Uh, there are other enabling sectors here that we often talk about, um, you know, lawyers, accountants, um, there are, uh, it's that engagement with the private sector doesn't need to be or shouldn't just be limited to, to financial institutions. Um, and it can include logging and mining companies. So these are areas that um, uh, FIUs may not traditionally engage with or think about engaging with, but will have a real impact, I think, on um, uh, the fight against environmental crime. Um, and uh, they should consider increasingly outreaching to, to NGOs. Uh, we heard from uh, one NGO here in the questions. I know there, there are so many NGOs who are actually leading the work on environmental crime. And so there needs to be, I think, um, uh, a much greater collaboration uh, and information sharing amongst, uh, amongst NGOs. Um, then it's important for law enforcement and FIUs to have a, a clearer division of authority uh, over environmental crimes and related financial investigations. Uh, many environmental crime agencies lack specific investigative techniques uh, needed to address environmental crime as a financial crime and serious offence. Um, I think we need a, a more proactive approach to environmental crime um, to uh, to improve the sort of early detection mechanisms rather than the, the much more reactive approach that we've seen generally to date. Uh, the work of the FATF um, so far has shown that um, criminals often commingle legitimate and illegitimate goods early in the supply chain. Uh, for example, at the, the refining stage for precious metals or the extraction point for, for illegal logging. Um, so this early commingling presents 
a major challenge for FIUs and the private sector to detect related laundering activity later in the supply chain. Um, and without further information on, on anomalies from source countries. Um, seizing and confiscating assets related to environmental crime often presents additional challenges uh, for authorities due to um, their, often their hazardous or bulky nature, uh, hazardous waste, large volumes of timber, for example. And it's important that countries develop guidance for their law enforcement agencies on how to effectively trace, seize and, and manage such assets. Um, there are unique challenges in detecting suspicious activity in this area, environmental crimes generally. There are far more gray areas between legal and illegal activity than, uh, than in other crimes. There's less open source information, less guidance from the public sector. Um, however, the FATF work so far has identified um, some important steps that the private sector could take. Firstly, um, looking out for customers operating in the legal supply chain for natural resources, uh, for example, wildlife, gold, diamonds, timber trade, etc. Uh, as often companies, as I mentioned, co-mingle co legal and illegal goods. And secondly, looking at the gains from environmental crimes that can appear as savings rather than proceeds. So it's important for financial institutions to be familiar with commodity prices, uh, for example, uh, whether wildlife, uh, logs, waste treatment, etc., cetera, um, uh, and, and to detect financial anomalies in, in, in those transactions. Um, so uh, that's just a few things that I, I wanted to end on. There are ongoing initiatives in a number of areas to, to strengthen controls and due diligence against environmental crime. We talked about the work of the United for Wildlife initiative, which I think has been transformational here. We heard about the lessons we can learn from, from work on, on human trafficking uh, and human slavery, uh, which are very pertinent. Uh, and these initiatives need to continue to be encouraged um, and to help the private sector drive forward financial integrity, uh, public-private partnership um, with environmental crime, as in all other types of crime, is, is, is got to be a priority. And I think this panel is a great example of that and has given a great example of that. So um, with that, I would like to thank the panel again. I'd like to thank uh, the Basel Institute and, and the OECD for organizing this series um, of, of webinars and to thank those who wrote in uh, with questions. So thank you. Uh, I'm sorry we missed Greta. Um, I'm sure she sends her best, but the good news is she's working on this actively in Tanzania. So I'd rather have her there working on the problem uh, than, than here with us today, maybe. So, Gresha, if you can hear us, um, Godspeed. Um, and uh, thank you again to everyone that joined us today. Bye for now. Thank you, David, for your wonderful moderation and uh, doubling your work effort at a moment's notice. We really appreciate it. And the, the phenomenal summary. So, clearly, the FATF is ready for any challenge thrown at them. Um, thank you, all your participants as well. Um, we really uh, appreciate your time and your interest in this series. Um, we, will, we will release a summary of the event uh, afterwards that we will uh, email to all of you. Uh, and of course, um, please uh, do sign up for the April event that uh, focuses on behavioral insights and how they contribute to environmental crime and corruption. Um, so without further ado, and uh, final thanks to the participants and to David again. Uh, and of course, to our donors who are generously supporting the implementation of this activity. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in April. Thank you very much.